Got her. <laughs> That's now on YouTube. Mm. God knows what responses we'll have on social media. Yeah. Fly killer. Hi, that. Hi, <laughs> nice to seeing you. Nice to see you virtually. <laughs> yes. it's, it's been a little while. I know, I know. It's uh, these days. Uh, <laughs> this is so different. Everything is so different now. Yeah. Hi, Susan. You made it. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that sudden time change panic last no, night. No, no, no. I was also kind of panicked in the beginning, but then I realized. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm up, but I'm less up at seven in the morning than I am at eight. <laughs> okay. That's a huge difference. Huh? Okay, good morning, everybody. Hi, Jose. Good to see you. Good, good to see you, too. you too. Even though it's six, let's let's wait another minute. Um, sure. Numbers are still increasing. Okay, so the it numbers seem to... Like, yeah, it looks like the, the numbers... Ready, so oh, start. Okay, um, then let's start. As always, <laughs> oh, as always uh, big pleasure um, seeing so many of you joining uh, our webinar on protein folding uh, and dynamics. We have a terrific speaker today, Yvette Bahar, who uh, pioneered um, a new and very efficient method in computational biology. And I think we all agree that uh, molecular simulations really became one of the cornerstones of modern protein sciences with a wide range of different applications. Yet I think it has been and it still is um, still a challenge to draw conclusions from uh, simulations that would go beyond the specific system that is being simulated. And, and Part, this is due to the fact that in biology anyway, everything is about specificity. That's why we, uh, we're interested in it. But secondly, also because 
Um, I think protein dynamics doesn't really have a good predecessor in physics, not even if we think about glassy systems and sort of general conclusions or general questions such as how um, does the three dimensional structure of proteins constraints and restricts the motion of proteins are really difficult to, um, to ask and to obtain results on. Now, in 1953, uh, a model was published. Nowadays, it's known as the Rouse model uh, in polymer dynamics. And this model was very simple, just beads and the collection of springs connecting them. And it was quite successful in describing the vis viscoelastic properties of polymer solutions. And um, Yvette Bahar, our speaker today, actually realized that there is more to this model and to this idea, and that this, uh, this simple collection of springs and beads can actually be used potentially to also understand the collective dynamics of proteins. And she pioneered what is nowadays known as the elastic network model, a model that has clear advantages, simplicity, unique solutions to each structure, applicabilities to larger assemblies, even up to chromatin, as you will hear from her today. And so it really gives me a particular pleasure to welcome you, Yvette. Thanks a lot for taking time and uh, in joining us today. Uh, Yvette Bahar is a professor at the University of Pittsburgh. She chairs the Department of Computational and Systems Biology. And this year she was elected a member of the National Academy of Sciences. So congratulations from all of us. Um, it's good to hear she is uh, on top of that, executive board member of the Biophysical Society and received many awards and distinctions. And I picked out just one out of them uh, because it, I think, shows um, how times are changing and were changing over the past four years. In 2016, she was invited to the White House um, to give a talk about multi-scale modeling um, and biology. And uh, to me, it shows that there were presidents in the past who were interested in science. And uh, with a little bit of luck, we will have uh, one who is going to be interested also again in the future. Now, today, Yvette will talk about her latest news using elastic network models to understand molecular machinery, missense variants up to chromosomal dynamics. But uh, Yvette, before I hand the stage over to you, I just would like to ask each of you um, in the audience to please mute your microphones such that we can listen to the talk without interruptions. And as usual, um, after the talk, we're gonna have a 15 to 20 minutes question and answer session. If you have a question, please use the chat window, type in, I have a question, and then I will call you up in person and you can ask your question uh, yourself. And uh, finally, I also would like to mention our next speaker in this uh, webinar series, Bill Eaton, who will talk on November 16th um, uh, and he is going to give retrospective on uh, modern kinetics and protein folding. And so with this, again, thanks a lot, Yvette, for joining us today. It's a, it's a real uh, great pleasure to have you today. And um, we're all looking forward to your talk. Um, I'm just stopping sharing my screen. And okay. I'm sure you're... Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. <laughs> and thank you very much for the invitation. It is an honor to be uh, talking in this series. Uh, so let's see. I assume that you are seeing my screen now. Yeah, we do okay, see it. Great. Perfect. Okay, so uh, as uh, uh, Hagel described, I'm gonna speak about uh, uh, molecular, how we use elastic network models for molecular machinery understanding missense variance and chromatin dynamics. So here is the plan. I'll give an overview, brief overview of the elastic network models uh, that are at the heart of all those uh, applications. The remaining three items are mainly applications to understand functional mechanisms and to evaluate the impact of mutations and to also understand chromosomal dynamics. Of course, each application requires a lot of innovation at the same time, but they are all based on the elastic network models. So what are the elastic network models? Why do we use network models? So uh, the major uh, and perhaps uh, the only uh, advantage of elastic network models is the fact that they take account of the contact topology. So this is the way we view molecules, you know, composed of a series of beads and springs. And the shape, the form is rigorously accounted for. 
So in this uh, issue of science in September 2018, that issue was actually dedicated to the significance of the form, how the, there are forces behind form that actually define the functionality. In a sense, the form, the shape defines the function, which then feeds back to the structure for further refining the structure through evolution. So it is uh, extremely, for our view, important to take rigorous account of the form. And then uh, another important property is the fact that we can uh, you know, dissect the structure, structural dynamics into a collection of independent modes and then focus on individual modes to understand better how they relate to function. Uh, to me, the most beautiful aspect is uh, the efficiency and applicability to big data. And I'm going to show you today how we apply uh, ENMs uh, to understand the pathogenicity of single amino acid variants, mutations, and also the applicability to large structures and chromosomal dynamics is going to illustrate that type of applicability. Here, you know, uh, in recent years, uh, they, uh, we got lots of technological advances in characterizing the structural properties of the genome so, uh, using high C technology. And now we have this type of contact maps, if you wish, for gene-gene contacts or contacts between gene loci. And if you look at the overall structure, actually, of the uh, chromatin, you, and you enlarge a small portion, you can see some patterns that are being repeated. Or if you enlarge this small portion of the contact map, you can see the same pattern, you know, nearby uh, contacts that are sequentially close uh, are more populated than the uh, spatially closed ones, etc. Now this type of uh, actually uh, applicability of, this, of similar patterns at multiple scales is nothing else than actually a consequence of the fractal geometry of nature, which is very illus nicely illustrated by this uh, plant here, where you can see the entire structure or at uh, much smaller scales, you have the same pattern that's being repeated. So that's what we are doing after all with network models, because we construct them at multiple scales uh, for example, in the uh, atomic scale, we will have a network node representing a single atom, or we can represent a residue by a network node in the anisotropic network model. That's the most broadly used elastic network model. Or we can have some segments as we applied in the past to hemagglutinin or gloriad. Or we can have a rigid block that is represented by a node, network node, or an entire monomer, as you will see in viral capsids. And then finally, in chromosomes, we have now gene loci of uh, 5,000 bases, which are now represented by uh, single nodes. Uh, so the, the most you know, broadly used model, again, the ANM. Uh, actually uh, goes back, uh, and even the Gaussian network model, it goes back to the uh, theory and methods that originally Flory, the Nobel Prize in 1974, pioneered. And he Hegel already mentioned the, the uh, how we have the Rouse model in polymers, which was very inspiring to us. So suppose now you have a structure, uh, and uh, suppose in you, you you represent the structure as a network, elastic network, and then if you enlarge a portion, you can see how it is composed of uh, nodes and springs. This movie gives a very brief outline. So suppose you take a given protein, we focus on the backbone, and then on the alpha carbons, uh, which in the uh, isotropic network model represent the nodes, so the alpha carbons. And pairs that are within a cutoff distance that we uh, deduced from the packing of structures uh, are connected by elastic springs. And now once we have this network representation, you can use fundamental theories of solid state physics to evaluate the different modes of relaxation, uh, equilibrium fluctuations, and that's what we are doing. Okay. So in summary about the theory, uh, in mathematical terms, and I have just very a few slides <laughs> showing the mathematics. If we have a Rouse model, the Rouse model was originally introduced for pro uh, polymers, which are extended 
and only the uh, nearest neighbors along the chain are connected. The corresponding potential is a sum of harmonic uh, potentials. And uh, we have uh, uh, we have here, we can write uh, the potential in terms of a unified, a uniform force constant, uh, or uh, we can express the distance changes. For example, delta R23 is the distance change between those two bits in terms of the change in the position vectors of these, uh, the bits themselves. So it turns out that uh, we can express this type of harmonic potential in a very concise form with the help of a connectivity matrix, also called Kirchhoff matrix here. The diagonal elements are minus one. Anything that's connected is minus one and the diagonal uh, terms of diagonal is minus one and the diagonal is the negative sum equals to the connectivity degree of each node. So if we post and pre-multiply the Kirchhoff matrix by the fluctuation vector, we obtain the overall potential. So this overall potential in matrix notation is nothing else than this one. So how do we move to proteins? We just replace the Kirchhoff matrix by you know, what we all know as contact maps. Now we have uh, off-diagonal terms also being non-zero provided that they are within a cutoff distance of interaction. And this cutoff distance represents the first coordination shell in the vicinity of any residue. So this type of, uh, now once we know the Kirchhoff matrix, actually we know a lot. Uh, now this is not, not anymore the RAS mod model for polymers, but it is the Gaussian network model for proteins. That's it, this is the model. And, uh, and gamma, the uh, connectivity matrix, provides the complete description. In the extension to three dimensions is the anisotropic network model. Now, instead of an n by n uh, connectivity matrix, we have a three n by three n Hessian composed of three by three super elements, each element representing the second derivative of the potential with respect to those equilibrium coordinates. And the potential itself is again a sum of harmonics. So it is extremely simple, uh, but using this very simple theory, uh, the most important probably property that we obtain are the cross correlations, which are the elements of the covariance matrix. So that's very important for covariance where, uh, or whenever you have a network, you would like to understand how signals are being propagated or how cooperative events take place between remote locations. So the inverse of the uh, connectivity matrix is proportional to the covariance matrix or the matrix of co co cross correlations. In other words, uh, the cross correlation between the movements of the fluctuations of two nodes will be simply found from the negative, from the ij element of the inverse of gamma. Or the mean square fluctuations are the diagonal elements of the covariance matrix. So that is a, Furthermore, we can decompose uh, the connectivity or Hessian matrix into a contribution of several eigenmodes, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And this way we dissect, uh, what I mean by dissect is we can you know, extract the contribution of, let's say the most cooperative motion, which uh, survives at longer, longest times. So that is uh, the type of, uh, uh, these are examples of modes that are extracted for HIV protease. You can see here, for example, that, uh, H, I'm sorry, HIV reverse transcriptase, you can see the fingers, finger domain moving with respect to the thumb and RNAs H. This is the slowest mode, uh, lowest frequency mode, which we call ANM1, uh, the most cooperative movement, which is also functional. That's where the RNA is being held. And now you have a series of higher modes, two, three, four. So you can see how the fingers and thumb move together, et cetera. And as you move to higher and higher modes, you have stiffer or more localized motions. So this is a nice uh, passage for me to move to the predicting functional mechanisms. Uh, as we've seen in uh, reverse transcriptase, actually we can apply this to any protein, any assembly uh, in the PDB, which we did actually. And we have, uh, for example, typical uh, motions of the chaperon in Groyal would be this type of counter rotations of the two rings uh, processing the misfolded or partially unfolded uh, peptide instead, protein. 
Or for example, for ampaviceptor, you can see how the antiterminal domain and the ligand binding and transmembrane are coupled, allosterically coupled uh, for the tetramer. So we can uh, determine like uh, using this type of approaches, the uh, most cooperative uh, movements that are definitely beyond the reach of conventional MD simulations. And uh, to us, understand, uh, you know, determining, visualizing these movements is a way of reaching structure and function through intrinsic dynamics. So we have uh, uh, recently also extended the methodology to cryo-EM structures. In this case, we don't even use the coordinates anymore, but we're using the electron density maps. And you can find what the cooperative movements of different subunits, in this case, the mammalian Shapiranian are. Or another example uh, application, actually uh, uh, quite uh, not recent, but uh, still very <laughs> relevant, is the application to the entire viral capsid in the case of in this case HK97 bacteriophage, which uh, maturates from this uh, you know original uh, prohead structure to head two, and uh, this involves several uh, movements, collective movements which we roughly show in these movies. I don't think the movies are very visible. However, the bottom line is that if you take uh, out of uh, thousands of accessible modes, just the top 10, 11, which is quite a small uh, fraction, less than 1% or 0.1%, you know, the, uh, the displacement in the individual uh, residues uh, the, uh, that are predicted correlate to the change in their position from this, th th these two ends by a correlation coefficient of 0.98. So these, a very small set of uh, global modes, what we call, actually dictate the global rearrangements and they are very useful. Another application was the, for example, understanding the machinery of uh, gamma secretase uh, you know, in the when in the presence of a, a GSM gamma secretase modulator, which uh, keeps the structure in a closed form, the amyloid precursor peptide cannot approach uh, the uh, its binding site and the catalytic site. But this intrinsic ability to open, seen by this movement, uh, in the absence of GSM, because otherwise GSM glues them in a you know locks in a closed form conformation. In the absence, it will open up, the peptide will move, proceed inside, will position itself into this, uh, you know, there are two cleavages successive, the endopeptidase and carboxypeptidase cleavages, uh, resulting in the, you know, release of the uh, A beta uh, to this extracellular region. So it is possible for us by just using a few modes of motion to rationalize what are uh, existing mechanisms. So for those of you who are interested, we have been, uh, uh, we have in, uh, developed an interface, ProD, for uh, the, uh, for example, suppose you have a favorite protein or favorite sequence, you can give it as an input, you're going to retrieve from the PDB all the structures that share this uh, sequence within a uh, the predefined sequence identity threshold then you can superpose them and you can see what the ensemble of structures or you can take just one of them and the structural changes uh, that is predicted by the elastic network model and that observed experimentally in this ensemble could be compared to each other and you can come out with uh, you know dominant mechanisms of motions how do you sample the conformational space you can compare with md etc so it is amazing because that study, the theory was introduced in 2009 and the interface in two years later. Uh, it has been since then downloaded more than 2 million times and uh, by, visited by more than 140,000 users, which is quite a, a high number for something purely theoretical. And another interface for biologists, which doesn't require any computing uh, background, and you can intuitively, you know, use uh, enter your favorite protein, and you could include the environment, the membrane, or the assembly, the biological assembly, the way you like. Is uh, dynamics again? Those two resources uh, are, to me, uh, right now, the most useful two resources that we have in this area. 
And so just a quick discussion before moving to the next item. We have, uh, you know, we are learning about global features, but at the expense of atomic details, we don't have atomic uh, resolution nor specificity. We don't have any chemistry after all, it's all physics only. <laughs> and then the idea, the question, natural question is, can we improve the precision of this type of studies? Can we, okay, use MD and try to take advantage of the best of both worlds? We wrote recently a, a opinion a review <laughs> where we, this looks a little bit too confusing, but at the center, you have the methods like ENM based methods, MD, Monte Carlo, et cetera. And then these are at the periphery, these are the uh, tools, if you wish, that have been developed that combine them. So these are all hybrid methods. And I think uh, there is a lot of progress in this field right now. I'm going to just talk about two of them uh, that we, one of them is co MD for collective molecular dynamics that we introduced actually. Uh, more than a decade ago, together with Klaus Schulten and Imat, uh, and implemented in MD. In this case, it is uh, actually MD centric. And the idea, the whole idea, is that you carry out MD simulations, but targeted MD simulations, and the target confirmations are those predicted by ANM, the collective motions. So, in a sense, you are biasing the trajectory but biasing in a direction that is intrinsically accessible, uniquely accessible to the structure. So we have many, many applications since then and extensions, but I, this type of uh, study uh, allow you to efficiently sample the conformational space. That's an advantage at atomic resolution because now you take each path, each step is a collective movement along those softest, uh, you know, uh, movements, motion modes. The other one is class DNM. Class DNM is slightly different. It is a uh, not DNM centric, let's say. It's a sampling method, but uh, while we are doing sampling, we also refine, you know, the uh, generated confirmations at successive steps by reverse mapping them to their full atomic representation and energy minimizing. So one of the very interesting applications was to understand the ribosomal machinery. And more recently, just a few months ago, we've seen how it proved useful in the application to protein-protein interaction predictions using HEDOC. So coupled to HEDOC, now you have, you can sample alternative conformations of the protein and then make, uh, have things, uh, you know, easily generate an ensemble for docking simulations. And right now we are uh, developing the interface very soon to be submitted. Uh, so the whole idea, you start from a PDB structure, you relax, the, you do a short energy minimization or microdynamic simulation. You start sampling uh, alternative conformations along the different modes. You cluster them. To, uh, then you have a second generation and you could be doing that. And you end up uh, actually sampling multiple points on the conformational energy map. Now the background contours, they are obtained by uh, detailed simulations uh, it, and it takes weeks. And those points are just obtained by sampling within hours. So that's the big advantage. All right, now I'm moving to the new uh, applications, uh, which, are, uh, <laughs> which are to us extremely exciting. Uh, the first one is to understand how mutations, single amino acid variants affect uh, functionality. And uh, we are using ENM predictions for doing that. This, uh, the theory originally was introduced two years ago. And again, in the same uh, pattern, we have recently published the interface where you can do everything uh, for your favorite <laughs> mutations you can examine, you can, you know. Uh, so a bit, a bit of a background, you know that uh, one of the most commonly used software for that uh, understanding how uh, genetic vari variations and in particular the single point mutations affect the function is Polyfan2 introduced, uh, I'm sorry, Polyfan2 by uh, Sunyaev and, and collaborators. So that is a, a summary of what uh, this software does. 
uh, you take a non-synonymous yeah, SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism, or a amino acid change. And then you analyze the sequence, a series of sequences through multiple sequence alignments. And if available, the structure. In terms of structure, actually, uh, what Polyfan2 does is to take those accessible surface area, hydrophobic capacity, and B factors at the position. And then based on these features, these are features that you extract, you build a machine learning algorithm and you can try learn from existing data to start to make now uh, assign scores for probability of being deleterious, dam damaging, or neutral. And then you can even provide some prediction confidences, et cetera. So what did we do? We said, okay, these all those studies, actually the large majority take sequence into consideration. So even introducing the structure is an improvement, but then we said, okay, we're gonna also introduce dynamic features. And the reason we could do that is because ENMs, you know, are extremely efficient. You can serially apply to thousands of uh, variants and it is, you can uh, easily uh, generate data. Okay. And we started with very uh, simple uh, uh, features like uh, the mean square fluctuations. So uh, we did with uh, Lila actually in a, a study, we determined what are the residues that are most, uh, Lila Girash, most uh, uh, effective in uh, communicating this uh, allosteric signals, effectors or sensing them, etc. So these are a little uh, small properties that we can easily calculate using uh, elastic network models. Now we need to learn. To learn, we <laughs> when we look at the existing data, that was that's really uh, uh, a big part of the study is to come up with an integrated data set. So these are the different databases and you can see how they partially overlap or not. And uh, we have uh, using them, we came up with 20,000 unique uh, single amino acid variants that also have a known structure. So we put together a machine learning uh, algorithm, a random forest classification, classifier if you wish, trained on those unique uh, single amino acid variants and uh, checked by the 10 cross-fold validation. And the first thing we wanna see was uh, how accurate is it? Uh, is, does it really make a difference to add the dynamic features to, in addition to sequence and structure? That was the first question that we asked. And then the answer is actually, uh, if you do this type of rock plots, you know, you rank order your predictions that were hidden. Uh, and then you see whether the prediction is uh, accurately predicted, uh, the hidden uh, SAB, the hidden uh, variants effect damaging or neutral? Is it accurately predicted? If so, it's a true positive, et cetera. So these type of plots, normally if your uh, algorithm doesn't do anything, uh, you get this uh, diagonal term. And the more you move away from that, the better. So th if we use only sequence properties or only dynamic properties, that's what we obtain. And dynamic here includes also structure, so. So, but if you use all three of them, sequence structure and dynamics, then we can see a big improvement. So the first question, does it matter? Yes, it does. It makes a difference to include dynamics. And uh, you know, the area under the curve substantially increases compared to taking a long sequence. The second question was uh, how much the different features contribute? So the sequence features are important as well as the surface area. But then the dynamic features, they have also substantial contribution when we evaluate the corresponding features. More important is the fact that these, uh, uh, this type of analysis, our software is not a black box after all, and we can go back and try to see for a given protein. So what are the features that we calculated? For example, this, uh, if this residue turns out to be uh, undergoing a deleterious damaging mutation, or we can say, oh, this is because it's very stiff at this position, or it plays an important effector role. So the allosteric communication is not going to take place. The surface access, it's very tightly packed, etc. So we can uh, now go back and uh, try to understand better at the molecular, structural, and dynamic level the origin of the observed uh, spores. So this is also another interesting uh, 
observation. Now, suppose we have developed our algorithm and we would like uh, to go back and look at the, we assign a score to each of them. And what are the predicted scores for the subset of deleterious uh, uh, mutations versus neutral mutations if we use only a sequence-based classifier? So here are the, you know, the neutral subset will give you this distribution and deleterious uh, the red one. And you can see how there is a marginal really difference and that makes things very hard to distinguish in principle. And now if I take the structure and dynamics only but exclude sequence, this is what I get. You can see already that the structure and dynamics provides a much better discrimination. You know, the scores now at, a, at this level, if the score is 0.7, they are both equally probable. So there is 50% chance of being deleterious. But then in other regions now, it becomes a little bit clearer. But most importantly, I'm sorry, most importantly, when you take all three properties together, look at the difference we have achieved now compared to only sequence. Now, uh, for example, this in this region, it is very highly to be neutral if an unknown uh, protein or substitution turns out to give this type of score. So I think this, is, uh, this shows how the discriminative uh, power of dynamics helps in better evaluating the effect of mutations. And this is the interface we designed, Rhapsody. <laughs> we, we thought a lot about the name. It's rapid high accuracy prediction of self uh, outcome based on dynamics. So we have, uh, what we do is uh, any user that you can go to Rhapsody and you can submit uh, your mutation. And then we're gonna give you a score and a probability of being deleterious or damaging for any substitution for which there is structural data we need to have. And also we, sometimes even the sequence data is limiting because we need to have sufficiently large uh, multiple sequence alignments. So, one of the interesting things we can do is uh, we can do this type of saturation mutagenesis in silico. What does it mean? We can, uh, these are all predictions for a given protein. Uh, these are the uh, residue numbers. And these are the 20 different types of amino acids. Uh, in each column, one is white. It is the uh, white type amino acid. And then all other substitutions are colored. Uh, the red being really uh, damaging and blue being neutral. So you, we have a score or a probability for every single substitution at every single position, uh, which we can represent in this type of heat maps. And sometimes we can also look at the averages over columns. Some residues are really, uh, they wouldn't tolerate mutations at all. Others would uh, easily tolerate, but, uh, or others depend on the type of mutation, et cetera. So now we are able to generate this type of saturation metagenesis results in silico. And then in this, well, before we submitted that, we also found that there were another 5,000 variants which were not included in our original data set. And then we tested them also, and we got about the same performance here. The result uh, from Rhapsody is compared to 11 other methods. And you can see that uh, we have been, uh, the, although the method is very simple, it is uh, performing well. Then we said, can we further improve it? And uh, maybe what we are neglecting at this time is also more information on sequence, and in particular, mutual information, co-evolution, because we have information on residue conservation, but not on co-evolution. So we, this is a, uh, an extension of PRODI, a mod module in PRODI takes, uh, uh, consider this type of evolutionary uh, patterns. And we have also did, uh, we did this with Amnon at Weizmann, uh, a, a comparative study of you know, how effective these different methods are. So we use uh, the features in PRODI actually to calculate a sequence entropy and mutual information. And that helps, that improves. So we have incorporated uh, co-evolution features also in Rhapsody now. And then uh, there is a study by the lab of Chris Sander and Deborah Marks at Harvard, which uh, you know, has been <laughs> catching our attention for quite some time. And they got this EV mutation, which is very powerful, only using uh, 
coevolution practice, but accurately dissecting, uh, you know, the direct and indirect effects and focusing on direct effects, they are able to accurately predict the effect of mutations. Uh, because after all, if you take the, uh, if you have a rigorous evaluation of cross correlations, you also know the conservation, the sequence patterns have a lot of information. So when we, uh, what we did was uh, we have uh, our original uh, uh, version, reduced version, where we also added the blossom uh, amino acid substitution scores. And then uh, this is called the reduced model. And then addition of evolved properties, entropy and mutual information is our full rhapsody. Uh, and at rhapsody, you have these options, you know, you can look at these. Uh, and then we also did some kind of meta uh, analysis where we use the epistatic energy change from EV mutation software and combine it uh, as an additional feature. And you can see there is a slight improvement in accuracy. Uh, represented by this area under the rock plot. Uh, so overall, and we compared with polyphan 2 and in mutation, we are quite <coughs> satisfied with the performance. I can go into more details, but I think it's, uh, I need to move on. The more, one important point is that uh, when you do the reduced version, you can apply the, the calculation uh, here to a much larger data set. This is the la uh, size of the data set. Here, when you do uh, incorporate uh, mutual information, now you need better multiple sequence alignments, which reduces the available data set. For example, even mutation is applicable to a smaller data set uh, than uh, polyphan 2. Polyphan 2 is even bigger. We don't show that, but sequence only uh, can work in polyphan 2. So an application to uh, human RAS, for example, where they did, uh, we calculated the instant saturation heat maps, and then we compare uh, the usual thing, Rhapsody, even mute polyphan 2. And you can see that actually Rhapsody uh, results here based on uh, the specific amino acid or an average over all substitution of that residue. You can have those two measures, whether a residue is critical or not. And we can see that uh, it is uh, equally or outperforming existing methods. And in recent, uh, to us, the, this type of applications are really valuable. Uh, Jeff Brodsky approached us asking uh, about his favorite protein, a potassium channel. And uh, there are 34 uh, mutations that are known to cause uh, Barter syndrome associated, uh, Barter syndrome. And then uh, we could predict that 31 of them would be really uh, damaging. The other three we missed. But more importantly, we can also make the novel predictions. And uh, so we uh, uh, suggested 15 other cases where that would be uh, potentially damaging or neutral. We made uh, so also motivated by questions that Jeff Bratsky raised and uh, experiments after, uh, this, in this case, it is real prediction. It's not like post-prediction. Uh, 13 of those 15 were correctly predicted. So uh, these are the type of uh, studies. Just a quick discussion before I move to the last part of my talk. Uh, including dynamics in addition to sequence and structure helps better assess the impact of mutations. And we could do that because we're using elastic network models. They can be uh, easily, the outputs from ENS could be easily plugged in uh, machine learning based classifiers. And another to us very important feature is that we can go back and then understand exactly what is the molecular origin of the observed score uh, and try to improve uh, what our uh, methods. Okay. So there are still, there's still a lot to do. Uh, the fact of the matter is that as you add more features, uh, you know, the increase improvement in the performance is smaller and smaller, but it is, uh, it's true that we have many other features that we haven't yet incorporated. So uh, for example, focusing on specific uh, motions, how the vicinity of a given uh, amino acid uh, changes, if it's a mutant, for example, here, 
then uh, during the global mode, it may interact with another amino acid such that it's going to be stuck there and this type of mobility will be hampered. Or we, ha we haven't considered the protein-protein interactions known uh, from the protein data bank. So this is something uh, oligomers or even the interactions with membrane or small molecules. And finally, we can always improve the ENM to include more specificity, you know, assign force constants that depend on the contact order, residue specificity, et cetera. So I'm moving to the last part, the chromosomal dynamics. And uh, this is another topic to us, extremely exciting. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm not a genome person. I'm, I keep learning all the time. And I have learned a lot from my collaborator, Card, uh, at Carnegie Mellon, who is a, a genomics uh, researcher. Uh, so what we've done is uh, the in the first study we that was almost like a proof of concepts can we concept can we use elastic network models to explain uh, genome scale accessibility and some long range coupling that was the question so we use the simplest elastic network model which is the gaussian network model and uh, then we have another paper that uh, appeared this year so i'm going to summarize these two here, we started to focus on the differences between different cell types and how their differences would affect their function. So again, this September uh, 2018 issue, there is a very nice article on chromatin plasticity, you know, how we now have a, a understanding of the three-dimensional features. Of course, I don't think plasticity is the right word. It should be elasticity. So if it is plastic, it can't come back. All the events are should be elastic. They should be, you know, they should occur, except for aging, but that's another issue. Uh, so chromatin dynamics, what we do is uh, we take uh, the contact maps from uh, the HiC uh, data. HiC data gives you information on gene loci that make contacts. So we construct the architecture of matrix. There is some renormalization, you know. Uh, normalization issues, but we have provided all the details and software. So we have, once we have the connectivity matrix, this is it. We can do the eigenvalue decomposition. We can calculate the covariance matrix, or we can calculate the mean square fluctuation profiles driven by different modes. So here is a result, uh, for example, for one, uh, for the original study focused on human lymphoblastoid cell line, GM1278. And this is just one chromosome, chromosome 17, which shows uh, the, as a function of locus index. So each locus in this case is composed of 5,000 bases. So what is the uh, mobility? That's the mean square fluctuation actually that we are calculating as a function of in locus index. And these are the blue curves are our theoretical results. And the yellow and orange are experimental, two different types of experiments. Both of them using different, actually they use different enzymes, but both uh, cleave uh, <coughs> the exposed regions, <coughs> excuse me, and then identify the regions that have uh, high accessibility. And we can show theoretically high accessibility and high mobility, they go hand in hand. So when we do this type of calculation and compare with experiments for all chromosomes, you can see that uh, approximately uh, between the DNA sec experiments and the predictions, the red, we have uh, about 0.75 or 0.8 correlation coefficient, which is quite uh, amazingly high to our view. Uh, even the two sets of experiments don't agree so well. Uh, by the way, those two experiments are very similar, but ATAC-SEC is uh, preferred because it is easier and faster. But these uh, calculations uh, suggest that perhaps it is worth doing the more elaborate experiments in this case. Another property we examined was the cross correlations. Uh, and these are measured by Chiapet experiments. So what uh, Chiapet experiments will give you will be uh, between two uh, different nodes, two different uh, gene loci. Uh, what is the correlation? How do, how do they correlate? 
are they coupled to each other or not? That's the type of information. They call these long range correlations in the literature because these, uh, these are separated by about 100 kilobase pair, which is to our uh, view, not, you know, everything is relative. Uh, 100 is, we are talking about, you know, 20 uh, points away here because each point represents five kilobase pair, right? So we are very close to the diagonal where it is very hard to distinguish the results as I enlarged here. Um, what we did is the following. There is experimental data showing uh, the extent of covariance correlation between those two uh, loci. And then we took as background their neighbors separated by the same distance. Okay? So, and, and we wanted to see whether uh, these experimentally detected coupled pairs were more correlated than those we call the background based on our predictions. And here are the two distributions uh, for, as you can see, the, those experimentally distinguished to be more coupled are also predicted by our theory to have higher covariance compared to others. Again, uh, this, uh, these are more qualitative, if you wish, results, but uh, in the right direction. Then we said, okay, we're gonna move a little bit further and try to understand whether uh, what we learn from the structural dynamics of the chromosomes could be related to their different function, the, the cell differentiation actually. Different types of cells have different uh, expression uh, patterns, different gene expression patterns. Now we took uh, 16 different cell types listed here and uh, we started to, we analyzed, uh, we had their data on their high C uh, behavior, high C data on all of them. And we analyzed all of them and we started to examine their fluctuation patterns, okay? Oh, so again, chromosome 17, 16 different types cell lines and as a function of the locus number, how much, uh, what is the mobility profile? We call that mobility profile, how much each gene locus, each locus, which usually comprises three to five genes, by the way, how much each locus would be moving. Okay. So we have uh, here, as you can see, uh, some of them are quite different. Uh, in this uh, region, we have the mesodermal uh, cell types, which uh, show some similarity. And then when we started to uh, compare them, uh, you, know, you know, pairwise comparison here, how similar are those patterns? Uh, we saw, uh, you know, some differences. When we take the averages over uh, different cell types, so how much, for example, HSPC correlates with all others, we obtain this type of uh, plots. So on average, we have 0.63. So there is a difference in the high C or fluctuation behavior of the uh, gene loci in different cell types. And then we said, okay, uh, let's try to understand what's the origin of those differences, because these may arise from two different sources. You remember the theory calculates a series of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, as I mentioned. Each eigenvector is a you know n-dimensional vector that gives you the mobility of every single node, in this case, uh, gene loss, locus. And then the eigenvalue is the weight, something like the prior probability of this profile. Okay? And so we, the difference may, could arise for differences in the shape of the modes, or the shapes are the same, but they are not, uh, they have different frequencies, probability. Okay? So we wanted, so it turns out, and I'm skipping a little bit here, it turns out that. Uh, what matters are, is the frequency. The eigenvalues are different, not the eigenvectors. So if we eliminate the differences in frequencies of occurrence, and if we replot the mobility profile, look at that, how similar they become. And instead of 0 0.63, we have 0.85. So what does it mean? What it means is that the following. So different types of cell, they share similar intrinsic motions. The eigenvectors are very similar. So I, in the background, you know, the accessible movements are like jumping, running, dancing. They do the same type of movements, fluctuations in space, collective motions. However, what differs is that 
the amount of time a given gene spans uh, does jumping, and another one is the, more into dancing, etc. So they have the same abilities, intrinsic abilities. This is like you know all the the DNA being identical in all of them, but some uh, do some specific types of motions more than the others, and it results in different mobility profiles. And then, okay, we now that we know that, we would like to understand then whether these uh, resulting distinctive mobility profiles relate to function. Now we know that each cell type has a different gene mobility profile and uh, we can define something like a generic profile averaging over all 17 types. Okay, this blue curve here for chromosome 17, of course we did for all chromosomes and for the entire chromosome. But if we take, uh, if we look at the differences in the mobility profile of a given cell type here, fibroblast, versus the mean, and we plot the differences. Now we see better what the differences are. And we focus on the regions that are, have the highest uh, departure in the sense that that particular cell type will have higher mobility at those loci or the corresponding genes. These are the points are the genes at those positions. Okay, so we know for each cell type, which particular genes will be, will have higher mobility. The question we raise is, are higher mobility genes also related to highly expressed ones? That's the question. Now, we know what are the highly expressed genes in different types of cells from uh, existing literature. There is this library, this database uh, that's maintained by Avi Mayan at, uh, Mount Sinai, and uh, he, so we have for each different type of cells, we have uh, for, uh, we know exactly what are the uh, gene expression profiles, which genes are more expressed, which ones are downregulated or upregulated, okay? So this is, uh, we use this information, and then it's a little bit like uh, some of you who do virtual screening, we screen it against a known profile. So for example, let's take the fibroblast, uh, highly mobile genes. What are the highly mobile genes? We have this difference profile. And from here, we evaluate the differences for all different types of cells, but differences in expression profiles. And we would like to see which one is most similar to our filter. This is based, or which uh, cell type shows an expression profile most similar to this mobility profile. And of course, the outcome is the, uh, we can discriminate among them, the fibroblast, if we use S filter, that one, which shows that the mobility profile and expression profile are very correlated, actually. So we've done this type of analysis, uh, rank ordering the most similar genes based on their expression profiles, knowing the mobility profile. So we have this type of results. So that's, uh, I, I, this is my conclusion now. Huh? I have uh, uh, tried to uh, explain how we can use high C data uh, for obtaining some information on the cross correlations for various, you know, spatial, now physical uh, uh, events, how much uh, spatial, spatial displacements, cross correlations for the chromatin, entire chromatin. And we can predict gene loci fluctuations and cross correlations in good agreement with uh, several different types of experiments. Uh, when we did the analysis for different cell types, it turns out that uh, it, we saw that some modes of motion are silent in some cell types. And those, uh, this is extremely important because uh, those uh, silent modes would be after all determining which genes are, have higher mobility, which also correlate with the more upregulated genes. So we could, uh, uh, I would like to remind that <clears throat> high C data refers to population average data. On the other hand, the analysis that we do based on elastic network models is also, we are evaluating average properties. So we're good. A more you know, detailed study could be you focus on a given cell type and different single cells uh, in the cell type where you would observe heterogeneities. This is a higher level of uh, you know, detail. We are not there. And of course, this study is related to the 4D genome initiative, as you can guess. 
and we could, uh, to me, uh, the exciting next step is now, what about the non-coding regions that are involved in transcription regulation? Uh, and can we relate their uh, mobility behavior, their dynamics, cross correlations to the gene expression patterns? So this is, uh, this is a little bit, my student wouldn't want me to show that, but uh, this is one of the, we use one of the structures that has been predicted earlier, actually, uh, for the entire, uh, you know, chromatin. You can see the different chromosomes in different colors. And when we do our AM analysis, this is the type of motion, you know, in three dimension, how the entire chromatin moves. Of course, this is not necessarily the only accessible conformation, neither the only uh, movement. But now we are starting to uh, generate, you know, this type of, uh, make some hypotheses at least on the four dimensional behavior of the chromatin. So that concludes my talk. I have enjoyed, uh, I've been very lucky to work uh, closely with many people. Uh, and I apologize uh, because I couldn't include all names here. Uh, but I have, uh, most importantly, my lab members, of course, uh, have been <laughs> playing a key role. Here is uh, John, who has been a major developer of Prudy, uh, together with James. John is also the person who did the application to the chromatin chromosomes. Luca is the mid-sans variants, you know, the, we call those precision medicine related predictions and uh, many others. And this is now what, you know, the previous uh, photo is not so new. <laughs> uh, and here's a most recent, this is how we hold meetings now. <laughs> And uh, here is uh, Pamra and Burak uh, uh, developing class DNA. And uh, Chelsea has been also co-authoring in the chromosome dynamics. Daniel now knows the Rhapsody. He has been effective in a new student. And with that, I would like to thank you all. Thank you very much, Eva, for a terrific talk. Thank you. Um, you said that there is going to be a question and answer session, and actually there are quite a number of questions already in the chat. Um, so should I stop sharing? Uh, yeah, I think maybe uh, maybe your talk, your slides may be helpful in, in answering, but you will see. I mean, you can start sharing. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. I will go back then. <laughs> okay, so um, let me see the chat. So the first question is by Miranda Lynch. Uh, Miranda. Please ask your question. I can't oh, hear. Gosh, yes. Okay, so she just wrote she doesn't have a microphone, so um, okay. I will read it for her. Um, so she asks, can these network representations be extended to other forms of protein contact, such as protein-protein uh, interactions or protein complexes, where the connections would involve non-within-chain attachment, attachments between individual proteins? Yes, of course. So that is, I think that that's the major utility indeed, Miranda, because that is, uh, we apply to, uh, uh, you know, protein assemblies and uh, uh, supramolecular machines, if you like. Now, if there is a region that's very disordered, uh, you know, intrinsically disordered segment of protein, uh, that would not work because the fundamental assumption is we use a theory and the methods of solid state physics. Elasticity is a solid-like property. So if a region is disordered, more fluid-like, let's say, it's not going to be applicable in a strict sense. I think this captures it. And the next question is by uh, Raquel Lieberman, but uh, she informed me that she had to leave early for, okay. uh, for another talk. And so she was asking me to read the question. Um, for predicting the effect of mutations, does deleterious mean only loss of function? So oh. how can the algorithm do with the gain of function mutation? That's an excellent question, excellent question. Uh, actually, you know, uh, to us, uh, what we are predicting, and we are calling it deleterious, is when a given residue plays a critical role. And, uh, you know, the if the type of substitution is going to be pushing it in a range that will be, let's say, too tightly packed or impair its uh, uh, communication abilities in the network, etc. 
However, in some cases, the change induced may indeed result in a gain of function, not necessarily loss of function. So it is consequential and it may be a gain of function. And indeed in this last uh, publication with Jeff Brodsky, Journal of Molecular Biology, we have uh, focused more carefully on each case where there is a change in, uh, you know, we think this residue, this substitution will be consequential. That's the more exact term. And and some of them we you know thought that it might be causing a gain instead of a loss the only bottleneck you know why we can't do that right now in a systematic way is that we are using those databases where the only information that is systematically provided is they, that, this is a binary thing they say either it is deleterious or neutral that is the what we learn so I wish uh, there are, uh, and I'm hoping now with new technology, those saturation metagenesis experiments, etc., there will be a better discrimination of the role of the residues in the sense that whether it is, uh, where the functionality change with it changes, is it a gain or loss? And then we can learn, and then we can uh, use uh, the new algorithms to discriminate. But right now, the existing data doesn't permit us to unambiguous to this. So we can do case studies, but a systematic routine, you know, software that we're using will not distinguish that. Right. Okay, so, and uh, the next question is by Jose Maria Delfino, and he also asked me to, to read the question on his behalf. Um, so thank you, Dr. Baha, for a very insightful talk. In elastic network models, which are the most important factors giving rise to specificity in interactions? For example, surface complementarity, electrostatic interactions, occlusions of hydrophobic area, and so on and so forth. And I think this, this cooks back to the question of how to incorporate chemistry in the, in the elastic network models. That's correct. That's correct. Of course, uh, that's why... Uh, <laughs> You know, we, we don't have uh, any specific interactions in the original model, let's say. Now, there are many new versions uh, where uh, residue specific force constants are being assigned, uh, or the, it depends on the also size of the residue. And uh, the hybrid models, evidently, they take account of the full force field, etc. Uh, so, to my view, uh, this type of effects, rather than a given type, uh, for example, shape complementarity is very important, but it's already taken into account. Electrostatics, obviously, this is extremely important, but they are more effective at localized, uh, at small scales. So if you are trying to design a drug and looking at the vicinity, that's critically important. But if you are trying to understand the overall machinery as you go to higher, larger and larger sizes, actually, the method works better. So at that level, we don't really, uh, we think that the predictions are good enough for, you know, large scale supramolecular machinery. As right. we go to the smaller six scales, we need more specificity, obviously. And I, and I, and I guess we also try to use sort of uh, uh, force constants that differ between different types of bonds instead of using one generic one. This, this absolutely, of, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay, so next question is by Hyun Park. So Hyun, please ask your question. Hi, uh, so um, my question was, uh, I had a few questions. Can I concatenate them in one? Okay, so the first one was uh, in uh, uh, GNM, I think a Gaussian network model, like you make uh, the, the Curie Health metrics, like uh, I think, and can you use that to make like uh, like this dynamic motions like uh, an, an isotropic network model? Like, are they different things or? Yeah, what? yes, they are different. Uh, uh, it's a good question, let me explain. GNM uh, gives you only scalar properties. You have the connectivity N by N matrix. You, we don't have the X, Y, Z uh, coordinates. So uh, what are the scalar quantities? It's, for example, mean square fluctuations, cross correlations, we have those properties. But if you are interested in a direction of the motion, or if you would like to generate those animations, GNM can't do that. You need to use ANM. Oh, yeah. Then uh, the question, next question would be, then I use ANM because ANM does everything. 
Well, ANM has more uh, assumptions underlying ANM to obtain more results. If there is a property that you can calculate with the GNM, I strongly recommend to use GNM. It's more exact the outcome. But some features like the movements, you know, the animations, you can't. Then you use ANM. I oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, it, it was pretty clear. I, I just had to really clear my confusion yes. regarding the differences. So. Uh, the, the, actually, my questions were segmented. So in your uh, uh, random forest uh, model, your score is uh, what your probability or the AUC of your rock uh, are The score is uh, really a score. Uh, if I go back to the uh, uh, my presentation, the score is, uh, you know, like all machine learning algorithms, you, you end up uh, assigning a score. Uh, on the other hand, do you see my screen now? Yeah, we do, we do see your screen now. Yeah. But I, okay. So if, uh, on the other hand, if we would like to move to probabilities, uh, what we usually do is uh, actually, uh, because many users, they would like to see a probability. Then uh, we have, uh, we went back, you know, to uh, see, how the score correlates with the phenotype. And uh, here is uh, the distribution, okay? No. So if the score is 0.78, let's say, if there is 54% probability of being deleterious. If the score is uh, 0.3, you just look at the ratio, <laughs> you know, in the two histograms. So we, we converted those scores of uh, known cases to probabilities based on those histograms that we read. Oh, okay. Uh, so one one more question regarding that. So for your uh, uh, input, uh, so how big is your, um, say, um, dimension of it? Because I'm asking this because some of your input was like, say, metrics-based information, like mutual information between, I think, residue to residue. That's what I assume your uh, mutual information is. So in that kind of case, like, I think you have to do some pre-processing. Like if it's a metric space, don't you have to like, say make it into a 1D array or something like that? And if it involves such operation, like how big is your like input dimension? And isn't that going to- How big is what? I'm sorry. I, how the dimension of your input, input, the dimension, the like how big the, is it? The feature, the number of features you mean? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, it is very small, actually. That's the beauty of it. We have um, about 10 right now, uh, but very few. In case of like, uh, so mutual information is just one score or is it metric yes, space? Yes, for, you know, for every single uh, substitution, we just evaluate one value for the mutual information. And, uh, you know, in, much, in this random forest algorithm, you optimize the coefficients. Oh, uh, okay. So, uh, you, and uh, in terms of coefficients, I, sh I think, uh, I, I'm not sure if I have it here, but, uh, the, you know, mutual information is important uh, at, the, the very, at the end of the day, uh, but uh, not uh, so definitive. It's uh, everything contributes. And everything in our case is about 10 features, not many. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, so next question would be again by Miranda Lynch, but I put it aside for a moment because uh, uh, we don't want to extend to a one hour uh, question and answer session. So um, the next question is by Rafael Petrosian. Rafael. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, so my question first is, uh, is there an experiment with which you can directly test the elastic network model assumptions, for example, by experimentally measuring the mode uh, spectra and comparing it with the one used in the model. And the second one is how lipid uh, bilayer was modeled in the gamma secretase machinery study? Yeah, very good questions. Uh, in principle, you know, there should be, uh, there are many different uh, ways of comparing. We usually compare the uh, outcomes, like, uh, uh, for example, so we have a given type of motion and we try to see whether the predicted motion correlates with the known uh, endpoints of that particular protein. So if the, a protein has open and closed forms and we start with one of them, can we predict the other? So this is a, a routine type of comparison. 
using a, a ensemble of structures. If you go back, you know, uh, just to the very raw data, the eigenvalue spectrum, and uh, you know, you can do that uh, by uh, spectroscopy methods, of course. And indeed, that's something we are pursuing uh, right now. But it is uh, because of the approximations. I I'm sure we're going to have uh, trouble fitting exactly quantitatively, but at least qualitatively, we would like to see some patterns that correlate with this spectroscopy data. Uh, the second question was membrane. The, in the case of, uh, we have uh, a few papers where we have modeled the membrane as an elastic network model as well. And uh, so we are uh, approximating the lipid bilayer in terms of nodes and the springs, the sparsity and uh, force constant of which have been optimized by comparing with simulations, the more atomic level simulations. So we uh, did include in those uh, gamma circuitase study and most recent, for example, this interface dynamics that I mentioned. Uh, let's see, this one. Uh, you have the possibility of considering the environment here and the environment could be the lipid bilayer. We go to the uh, interface for constructing the lipid bilayer and we can do the membrane protein dynamics in the presence of the lipid bilayer. So we have, everything is approximate again, but uh, it gives you a good idea of uh, the global features, uh, most uh, collective features. I see, thanks for <laughs> Okay, so the next question is by um, P. Balletta. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Beth. Um, I was wondering uh, about a uh, classed ENM. I was surprised to see a relaxation as first step, since one of the benefits of ENM is not having to minimize the starting structure. Oh, so that's, that's an excellent point. <laughs> that's an excellent point. Indeed, uh, you know, we are in the, pr uh, you are talking about class ENM, right? Right. Yes, uh, I fully agree. Uh, the, the thing is, uh, you know, in this uh, schematic diagram, <laughs> it was uh, convenient to show like that, that you are really, <laughs> you caught a very good point. Uh, so where is it? Here. So in principle, yes, uh, that's the big advantage of the uh, ENM. Uh, you, you might uh, skip that step Indeed, we are right now refining this <laughs> paper to be submitted. We could sample first and uh, cluster, select representative ones, and this relaxation would be at that step. It's like an adaptive. You know, each time we generate a new set of confirmations, you don't want them to be unrealistic. At that level, you do some energy minimization or molecular dynamic simulations. So this relaxation, I think this is a very good point. It, sh it should probably be after the clustering. The cycle will be the same, but uh, at the very beginning, uh, you know, the order. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yes, thank you. So it's just a practical issue. <laughs> yeah, uh, um, you know, this was the way we showed here, but it would be better to probably refine this uh, uh, thing to put the relaxation after obtaining the representative structures, and then we go back to the NM sampling, etc. Cool, thank you. Uh, one last question. Uh, I've also uh, watched you talk about um, chromatin dynamics, but in that case, those researchers were using coarse grain MD. So I was wonder if I was wondering if you you've read about that and you know how does your method compare against coarse grain MD on chromatin dynamics? Yeah. No, I don't. I, I haven't compared. I didn't do that. Uh, uh, Jose would know some probably, <laughs> and he can give his comments. Uh, in our case, you know, what we're doing is uh, we use known uh, contact information to predict the fluctuation dynamics. We, uh, we have been avoiding the prediction of structures because there are so many structural models. And However, uh, just to show a movie, I used a model there. Maybe, Jose, you could add something, if you wish. <laughs> I can add a, a couple comments, basically. Our model has, a, uh, it has been good on doing predictions. 
I think I really like your talk on the subject, by the way. I think what's very interesting, what you can do with the, with just with these elastic networks. <laughs> My question that I would like to relate is that if you look at the dynamics of the chromosome, they are very viscoelastic. So they have a little bit of liquid behavior at long time scale. So the question is probably your model work on the short time scale is smaller lens, but I'm not so sure how it's going to work on the long lens when these things become much more liquid, right? To look at this. Could so be. it's a very. So I think that there's a lot of interesting challenge that go, but I really like the fact that uh, you took this sort of agnostic idea. I just do it, uh, 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 elastic network, and see what comes out of it. And some things appear to to work. So I think it's a very interesting thing to figure out if which process and in long time scales and short time scales. I think Absolutely. there's a lot to be done now. Absolutely, there is. This is you know just the beginning, and uh, there is a lot of room for improvement. <laughs> I agree, but this is extremely. Uh, us very yeah. I think deviations will be very important. Deviations will be very important to figure out when you're going out from this elastic to the sort of a more viscous liquid behavior. So that's what basically is. So I think a, a lot of stuff you get right would be interesting, but also where it deviates may be interesting. So I think it's, uh, absolutely, it's absolutely. I fully agree. <laughs> yes. So Jose, this, this was already your question because yes, you're I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, so next question is by Eugene Ruska. If you're still with us, Jim. I think many people left. <laughs> probably probably he, uh, he stepped out already. Uh, let me just see who else. Okay, so it doesn't look like there are other questions. So I can just read his question. Um, and so maybe he can, he can uh, listen to the answer uh, on YouTube. So his question is, how do you ensure the eigen decomposition is accurate for the largest systems? Well, you know, eigen decomposition is a unique solution, right? <laughs> so it is an analytical <laughs> solution. And uh, we, uh, irrespective of the size, now there are very well established uh, methods for uh, decomposing <laughs> large matrices. Uh, in our case, you know, these obey certain rules. Uh, we are talking about symmetric matrices, and uh, it has a, a you know, a zero eigenvalue, etc. But uh, these are, uh, you know, if the model is correct. <laughs> the eigenvalue decomposition is exact. So I, I don't worry about it. Right. OK, so I don't see any more questions. Um, so that means you're relieved of <laughs> duty. <laughs> so thanks a lot, Yvette, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, have a yeah. nice day, afternoon, evening. <laughs> we will. And the same Thank to you. Thank you very much, Yvette. Thank, Thank you. you. Love Thank to you. Thank America, you. friends, tomorrow. Okay, uh, we'll see. It's it's very, uh, uh, you know, uh, we are very very impatient to see what's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> we'll see. Too, yeah. yeah. Okay.